Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, which is all about why you need to train all staff in diversity and inclusion. So before we start, we just want to introduce ourselves, as we usually do. And our main presenter today is Terry Haywood, one of our HR consultants at HR Solutions. I'm Victoria Templeton. Some of you may know me from the webinars, and I'm one of the HR knowledge managers. And I shall be fielding, uh, if we have any questions, to Terry at the end of today's session. We also have a team that's joining us. A team will be in the background just to help support us with um, any technical issues, should any arise. Terry shall take your questions at the end of this webinar, so please do let us know if you do have any as we work through the webinar this morning. Please note that there are many of you attending today, and so for obvious reasons, uh, you all are on mute. But to raise a question for us to answer at the end, then please do start noting your comments in the, quest in the your questions in the comments box available to you on your dashboard as we go through. Here is a quick guide just to show you how you do that. You can ask the questions via the GoToWebinar panel that should look something like this. Please type your question in the questions pane and we'll aim to read out and answer as many as we can. We want to make this session as interactive as we would normally at any physical event, so we will be running a series of polls throughout the session as well. When we have a poll, it will appear on your screen and you just need to select the answer that's appropriate for you. Please note though that to be able to participate in the polls, you will need to ensure that your screen is not in full screen mode as for some reason it doesn't work um, under GoToWebinar in that structure, in that format. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Terry to take you through today's session. Over to you, Terry. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, which is about all you need to do, uh, all to do with what you need to do to train all staff in diversity and inclusion. So what I'm going to cover today is I'll start off by outlining the importance of undertaking training. Not always the thing that employees get too excited about, but an absolute necessity for any business. So why would that be? Well, a successful tribunal claim can prove to be quite costly. So I'll just outline the most recent statistics in respect of awards for dis discrimination cases. In a bit more detail then, I'll talk you through an important and relevant case from this year. So relatively hot off the press as these things go, which shows that even if you think you've done everything that you can to protect yourself as a business, you should always review that to make sure that any training is relevant and engaging. And finally, I'll give you my top tips, and that will take us through to the end of this shorter webinar where we will uh, then both take your questions. But before we get started, uh, I'd like to run a couple of quick polls. So, Victoria, if I could ask you, please, yes. to call up the polls for me. Lovely. I'm going to call up the first poll. Let's launch that for you, Terry. Fantastic. Um, we've got it on the screen for everybody. Okay. And the question there. Oh. Yeah. So when the was the last time? When... <laughs> so when was the last time you had equality training? Um, I'll keep the poll running for a little bit longer, but was that within the last year, within the last two to three years, more than three years ago or not at all? And I'll just keep it open to get a few more votes in and then I'll share the results. Okay, so I'm going to close that poll now, Terry, and okay. I'm going to share the results. So what we have, Terry, is that 45% um, last had their equality training within the last year. Within the last two to three years, nobody has put that in as an answer. More than three years ago, 27%, and not at all, 27%. Okay. So, um, over to you, Terry, with any commentary on that. Well, that's great that 45% of you have had some training within the last year. Um, it, it is quite important to keep it regular. Um, for, the, for those who had it a bit further away, um, probably time to, uh, to to refresh yourselves. Okay, so I'm going to um, call up the second poll. 
for everybody and this question is how satisfied are you that your equal opportunities policies are up to date are you satisfied not satisfied or you don't know so i'll leave the poll open for a few moments A little bit longer and then I'll um, before closing. Okay, and I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to share the results, Terry. So we have 73% satisfied, 18% not satisfied, and 9% don't know. Excellent. That's that's really good. Well, really good to see that there's mo the majority of you are absolutely satisfied with the, the policies you have in place at the moment. I think policies often are the starting point with these things. We always make sure we have them. Um, I, th I think as we'll, we'll, we'll discuss uh, as I go through the webinar this morning, um, the, the also looking at the training is absolutely key. So translating that from the policy into something engaging and understanding for your employees. Brilliant. So I'm going to um, take that poll off and then hand back over to you Terry for the rest of the webinar. Lovely, thank you very much. Okay, so as promised, why do we undertake training? And here we have a group of people here all busy on their phones of course. Um, so why do we go to the effort of putting on training courses? It's not really for our benefit and we've got this, oh, not equality training, oh she said she's had, uh, she's, she's read the policy, surely she doesn't need training. And, some people may feel they know it already. They were ha they may have been handed the policy when they joined. So what else do they need to know? And then we've got another person. I think they've had the thing. Oh dear. Well, they're saying they haven't got time for quality training. They did it a few years ago. So you know what's changed? And some may remember a previous course they attended. They may have even got a certificate. They might have even pinned it up somewhere. Surely they think there's no need for me to attend another one. Surely not. And then we move down, someone else is bound to have a thought. They've had their message to say there's going to be some equality training. Oh dear. Oh dear, she hates all this woke stuff. No one can take a joke anymore. And there may even be some members of staff who find the prospect of equality and diversity training is just a load of old nonsense and think that the company is just pandering to the woke brigade or the easily offended or even millennials. Of course, these terms are stereotypes, so there would appear to be good reason to send someone with these views on a course, as they may be the most in need and, more worryingly, the most at risk of bringing the company into disrepute. So why undertake training at all? Well, there's a number of reasons. A policy can be forgotten. If like myself, you're in HR, you can probably recite chunks of your equal opportunities policy. Why? Because it's a policy you may refer to regularly. That's not to say that you don't need training. We can all do with a refresher and the opportunity to listen and share ideas. The average employee, though, they may have seen it once, have a rough idea of what it was about, but then they go back into the day-to-day -day work and it all slips away. The second point is to raise awareness, and this is absolutely the main function of the training, and in my view, why it works best when you're receiving the training in a group setting. As everyone is different, everyone has different experiences. You're not just telling the staff, you're engaging with them, and in some cases, challenging their assumptions. Now, the subject of equality and diversity is never far from mainstream attention, and um, with the raised profile of campaigns such as Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and gender equality, there's always something to raise and discuss to bring these subjects to life. With expectations, roles, and responsibilities, it's a, cri a critical point of the training is to be clear that everyone within an organization is responsible for upholding the policy. This message should be loud and clear. Challenge your prejudices, assumptions, and stereotypes, or at the very least, park them at the door. The other point is defense. Ideally, you don't get any claims of discrimination or harassment ever. No grievances, nothing. But it's not a perfect world and things always slip through, sometimes deliberate, sometimes unintentional. 
if, however, you can prove to a tribunal, should you receive a claim, that this was just a rogue employee and you've made every effort to educate the employees to how they should and should not behave in the workplace, then you may be able to defend the claim. So what sort of financial risk could you be facing as an employer if an employee is able to prove that discrimination took place and you're unable to defend it? Now, whilst it's tempting to look at the maximum awards and the eye-wateringly high awards for cases involving disability and age discrimination on this slide, it's more useful to look at the averages. And by any measure, there's still amounts that you wouldn't want to pay out. And these, of course, are just the awards for discrimination and don't allow for any other awards such as for unfair dismissal or loss of earnings, or indeed the legal fees for putting the defence together and any management time used for providing witness statements or attending the tribunal itself. The point is that these are uncapped awards for discrimination and these are the latest statistics. They vary year on year and are dependent upon the type of cases received. So disability discrimination has seen the highest award this year, but that may not be the case next year. In fact, disability discrimination cases were slightly down in 2020, whereas age discrimination claims increased substantially. This reflects a steep rise in unemployment among the over 50s, with 284,685 redundancies among the over 50s in 2020, which was up 79%, which was highlighted to various media sources last month by uh, a campaigning group called Restless, a website community for people over 50. So external events in the world can have an impact upon the type of claim that's made year on year. So we've established why training is a good thing, but let's take a closer look at a specific case, LA UK Limited versus Galen. It's a case I came upon when I was put, actually refreshing our own uh, equality and inclusion course and thought it was an absolutely relevant and important case to highlight. So to tell you about the case, the claimant was uh, Mr. Galen, who is of Indian origin and was employed by LA UK Limited, a company that specialises in processing consumer claims, predominantly dealing with financial mis-selling and other regulated services. He joined on the 3rd of October 2016 as a senior data analyst, but was later dismissed with immediate effect on the 15th of September 2017 on the grounds of poor performance. After his dismissal, he brought a claim to the Employment Tribunal, alleging that he had been subject to harassment on the grounds of his race by one of his colleagues, Mr Pearson. The company carried out an investigation and concluded that Mr Pearson had indeed made regular racist comments, such as referring to his skin colour and telling Mr Galen that he should work in a corner shop, questioning why he was in the country and claiming that Mr Galen drove a Mercedes, like all Indians, in inverted commas. These incidents are reported to have occurred at least once a month. Some of the incidents were overheard by colleagues, including a manager, but nothing was raised by them. The outcome of this investigation was that Mr Pearson was required to undertake further training on equality and diversity, having originally attended a course in February 2015. At the tribunal hearing, the company attempted to defend the case by showing they had an equal opportunities policy as well as a bullying and harassment policy in place and could demonstrate they had provided training to Mr Pearson and his colleagues. Whilst they did not uphold Mr Galen's claim of direct discrimination, they did uphold the claim of harassment. They had tried to rely upon the defence that they had done everything they could to prevent any instance of discrimination or harassment occurring, but the tribunal did not agree with them. The tribunal did not accept the company's defence and highlighted that Mr Pearson had not accepted that he had done anything wrong, despite having attended the training in 2015, which suggested that the training had been insufficient. Other colleagues who had heard the comments from Mr Pearson did nothing to challenge them, despite having also received the training, including a manager. Mr Galen's manager did not know how to take action when the matter was raised directly with him. 
the training provided had made no reference to racial stereotypes. The anti-bullying and harassment policy in place made no reference to race and very little reference to harassment. Their equal opportunities policy made no reference to harassment at all. The tribunal described the training received by the offending employees as having been outdated and stale. The company appealed the decision. So the appeal was dismissed by the Employment Appeals Tribunal, just as the original tribunal had noted. The Appeals Tribunal examined previous cases where this defence had been used and held that the company could not rely on the defence of having taken all reasonable steps and agreed that the training that the organisation offered had indeed become stale and ineffective for the same reasons as found by the tribunal. The fact that managers of the business, if not the company, were aware that harassment was occurring should have led them to raise it and to refresh the training. I think it's quite important to quote directly from the Employment Appeal Tribunal's judgment, which said, whatever the merits of the training, the tribunal clearly concluded it was stale. Underlying that finding must be the obvious point that the less effective training is, the more quickly it becomes stale. The tribunal did not conclude that the training was stale merely from the fact that Mr Pearson had made racist comments. The tribunal held that a colleague had heard Mr Pearson make a racist comment, but did not report it to HR or management. Mr Armstrong, the customer services manager, had been told by the claimant that Mr Pearson had made racist remarks. Although he told Mr Galen to report the matter to HR, he did not take any action himself. Mr Bowman, who was technical operations manager, had heard Mr Pearson make a racially harassing comment, but rather than taking any steps to report it, had just said, Ian, man. That was sufficient evidence for the tribunal to conclude that whatever training there had been, it was no longer effective. The fact that Mr Pearson made the harassing comments was not irrelevant. There might be circumstances in which an employee has undergone training but is contemptuous of it and continues to harass. If the training was of a good standard and the employer was unaware of the continuing harassment, the defence might be made out. However, it appears in this case that Mr Pearson, despite having undergone the training, thought that what he was doing was no more than banter. That provided some further evidence that the training that was provided had faded from memory. The fact that managers were aware that harassment had taken place meant that the respondents should have appreciated that they needed to do more to prevent harassment and provide some further training. Respondent through their managers knew that harassment was taking place, but took no action to prevent it. The Appeals Tribunal ultimately decided that more could have been done by the company to prevent the situation from continuing as it did, and therefore the organisation was indeed liable for the harassment the claimant faced. The learning points on this really is that this case has highlighted the importance of having well-written employment policies and carrying out impactful training. It's not merely enough to provide some basic training as a tick box exercise if, as in this case, employees either don't engage with it or forget it quite quickly. And any training needs to be reviewed for content and relevance on a routine basis and repeated frequently enough for employees to be aware of the importance of it. The more involving it is, the better. And of course, it's important to cover key topics such as stereotyping and harassment. So here we go, I promised you some tips. The first one is to organise training for all new starters and refresh training for all employees at least every two years. This is important as things can change rapidly in respect of equality and it provides an opportunity to raise awareness if handled properly, rather than, as I said, being a tick box exercise that proves unengaging. The second uh, tip I'll give you there is to keep a record of attendance at training sessions. That's absolutely important when cases of discrimination or harassment take place, as it's your mitigation against a complaint and evidence to follow up at a disciplinary hearing with the offending employee if matters go in that direction. The third point is give examples of what is and what is not acceptable behaviour at work. It's all very well stating what your policy or legislation says, but to make it engaging, you can bring it to life by discussing scenarios. It's not just good enough to say, don't harass people, off you go. 
Number four, explain the rights and responsibilities of everyone in the workplace to ensure the policy is followed consistently. There might be a misunderstanding by some employees that they are somehow exempt from responsibility, especially when it comes to dealing with third parties you may have on site, such as customers or contractors. So it's a good opportunity to set them straight. And the fifth one, set out the procedures for dealing with complaints about discrimination or harassment in the workplace. What you also want to do is for employees and their managers to know how to raise an issue and what the next steps are. Again, these are absolutely crucial and every manager should know that a policy exists and to seek advice or support straight away if anything is raised to them. And from there, I think we're moving to another poll. Yes, Victoria. we are. So, <clears throat> thank you very much, Terry. So I'm going to call up the next poll. Let's launch that. And the question is, how confident are you that your equality training is understood and engaging your staff? Are you confident or not confident? I'll keep it open for a few moments. <clears throat> okay, and I'm going to close the poll and now share the results. So we have actually just 15% who say they're confident um, and 85% saying not confident, Terry. Wow, okay. Well, like, well, on the plus side, I guess that's why you're here, um, to, to understand a bit more about what you might need to, to do to change that. And I get that. We're all we're all busy in our in our respective roles. Uh, and sometimes when it comes to training, it may slip down the, 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 slip down the list of important things to do. But I think what this case shows is that a policy isn't enough, that the training needs to be a bit more engaging and relevant uh, and, and use scenarios and refer to uh, things like stereotypes. One of the criticisms in this particular case by the tribunal was that it had made no, absolutely uh, no references to sort of racial stereotypes and that's that's fundamental. We all know the kind of things that come up in grievances when these kind of things matter. It's not unusual for stereotypes to be um, one of the main factors to a complaint uh, around uh, either discrimination or harassment. Um, so, so it is a, it, about engaging with the materials and uh, making sure that what you've got is going, is engaging, is impactful, is hitting home. And whether you need to spread that out, it, uh, whether you want one session every two years, whether you want to break it down in, into chunks and deal with it on a smaller basis, there's a lot of different ways you can approach it. Um, but given that discrimination claims are uncapped, given that discrimination claims um, are, can be very expensive to resolve, whether you resolve that through a tribunal or through a settlement agreement, um, it's worth having some sort of defence in place so that you are engaging and enlightening your, empl uh, your employees. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to hide that poll <clears throat> and over to you, Terry. So that now brings us to any questions. So Victoria, do we have any questions that may have come through whilst I've been talking? We do, we have a few, thank you, Terry. So I'm going to try and group them where there's some similar questions. So um, one question is, should training always be face-to-face -face or can it be online with refreshers? And um, that links in with another similar question around, um, is e-learning sufficient as a method of training? With any kind of training, it really depends on the quality of what you're offering. Um, like I said, the criticism of LA was that the training didn't cover specific areas, and it was quite clear in the case of LA that it wasn't taken on board that racial stereotyping is, is inappropriate in the workplace, and it was very clear that that the, that the employees hadn't taken on board what you need to do if you overhear it or if it's reported directly to you as a manager. Now, I take the view on this so you can do it through a blended approach if necessary. I think keeping a refresher that's um, uh, that's 
either used through good e-learning. And what, what I say, what I mean by good e-learning is that I, if you, we've all had experience of it, uh, and certainly I've had experience many moons ago in a previous company where you could click through everything quite quickly. You could get your e-learning done um, and advance all the slides very, very quickly. Um, it's more, it's getting more sophisticated than that now, which is great, and it has become more engaging. So it is good. Uh, but I would take a blended approach to say, yes, you've got that, but I think maybe once every couple of years, it's good to have either this kind of you know, online Zoom Teams type um, uh, uh, training or even face-to-face. Or -face. And I, I say that for a very good reason, is that I think when you're in a group situation, you then get to, you get a better discussion, you get sharing of experience, and that's really valuable and a very, very key learning tool rather than everybody doing it in isolation. Yeah, absolutely, especially when it comes to people matters um, and managing people, absolutely, Terry. Mm. Okay, we, we, always, we, have, we have such diverse work groups that it's mm. good to get people together every now and then. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of... Um, Equality training. Somebody's asked, should we do equality training as part of the induction? I think it's important to cover it as part of the induction. Yeah, absolutely, because these are the people that are going out into your workforce. It depends. It might be something, you know, you've got a set course coming up within a couple of months afterwards that you can put them on. It depends how it, it works. But I think making employees very aware of it from the start, either through some training, whether that's some e-learning at the start, um, I think is better than just giving them a policy and hoping they'll read it. Um, everybody, will, some companies do operate by going, here's our policies, you read them, then you sign this form. And they're just, and we think, well, that's okay, we're covered. But the mm. reality is, as we can see here, it not it won't necessarily cover you if you haven't put the effort in to, put, to, to, make, to train them, to engage with them uh, with that particular policy. Okay. And somebody's asked, um, should the company have actually dismissed the offending employee? That's a good in question. Uh, yeah, that's a good question because you know the employee had had the training. Um, mm. We know that an investigation took place. What the tribunal uh, uh, didn't establish as to as to whether there was any disciplinary action. All we do know about it is that the offending employee was asked to take further uh, equality training. Right. I would say, based on the information we have through the tribunal there is potentially a case to answer in those situations. It might not led to, might not have led to dismissal, but it may have led to a disciplinary sanction of some kind. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that then gets it home clearer to the individual. Um, the individual in this case, uh, one of the criticisms of him was that he hadn't taken what he'd said that seriously. He didn't think it was that much of a big deal. He just thought it was, in inverted commas, banter and how often do we hear that used um so so i think there was potentially a case to answer and and based on on the facts of it it probably should have been a disciplinary yeah. investigation and potentially yeah. hearing okay brilliant thank you and then we've had another question in do you have any recommendations for addressing unconscious bias Which wow a that's a good one. question it is a very good question I think again, it forms part of any training that you deliver. Yeah. Um, because because it's so because unconscious bias is unconscious, we, we we're not always aware of it. So I think it should form part of your uh, equality training and make people aware of the different type of biases um, that are available. Uh, that are not available, sorry, that uh, yeah, that absolutely. exist. Yeah. Such as you know affinity bias, um, halo effects. Um, there's so many different ones that. That, that, that you can explore and mm. I think it's one of those that when you explore and discuss it with people it gives them a chance to be aware of it and to think wow okay I yeah. need to question that next time because something like affinity bias is how we build relationships it's a normal human thing but actually at work we can't make decisions based on we quite like somebody mm. it's a fascinating subject area actually unconscious bias it really is um and it, it it's it is just fascinating and it's not um in addition to obviously you know ensuring you've got the right training in place uh it's actually looking at your whole uh workplace practices isn't it through the whole employee cycle through for, yeah. starting with your recruitment the attraction of the applicants uh you know how you're conducting uh your interview uh, interviewing recruitment processes right through to um 
you know, training and development and uh, performance management, etc. So it does touch on the whole employee life cycle, and it's such a um, interesting topic, and actually probably one worth um, for um, a future webinar or um, some further information from us. But yes, um, good question. Thank you for that one. And we have a couple more questions uh, before we bring it to a close. Um, somebody's asking about uh, the frequency. So how often should the training and policies be reviewed? I, well, OK, in terms of policies, I, I think it's always good to have a review date on all of your uh, employment policies well, uh, because they do need to be updated. I, I think every two years, unless there's been some uh, obviously change in the law in the intervening time, I would say every two years for both, really, because yeah. I think that's a good enough time to keep it to, fret, to, to, to keep these things updated. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that would be my suggestion on that. Okay, thank you. How often should equal opportunities training be delivered, which um, I think you've touched on? Um, yeah, and it varies in companies. I think some do it yeah. every year, some do it every other, every other year. You might, you know, you might, might, again, you might want to do a more blended approach and do e-learning or something smaller one year than something more detailed the year after. It depends on, on, on your organisation, how that would work. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I think that's all our questions um, today, uh, Terry. So thank you for okay. fielding those. Um, some great questions from everybody. So thank you. Um, so I think that we're now bringing the webinar to a close. Um, we have one final poll that I would like to um, just bring up with everybody. And um, it's in regards to um, any follow up you'd like to see from us after today's webinar. Um, if you perhaps would like to participate in this poll, then let us know what it is that you'd be interested in finding out about. So I'm going to just call up the final poll. And I'm going to launch that now. So as I say, if you'd like us to follow up with you after today, um, then please do let us know and we'll be in touch. And that could be anything to do with our HR services, you know, training. So especially on the back of that case ruling and, and Terry's um, great update this morning, our knowledge, our knowledge base, which is where all our templates are, our policies, um, and any just, uh, you know, health and safety services and training and payroll. So um, if you would like to participate, uh, please do. I'll give you a few more moments. Okay, let's see where we are with the poll. Let's bring that to a close. And I'm now going to, um, that's great. Thank you for everybody uh, participating in that. We'll be in touch with those of you that have requested and, and on those particular areas of our service. And so um, we'll now bring the webinar to a close. And before we do, I just would like to let you know about training that we have coming up. And um, as you'll see on the screen here, we have um, health and safety training on the 14th of June. That's um, a training session face to face, obviously uh, COVID secure. We use fantastic facilities for that um, because it's health and safety. Um, it, it sits best with doing it in uh, face to face and in practice um, rather than remote. So that is um, our uh, remote training for the fire safety fire marshal. And then we have a couple of HR related training courses coming up. So on the back of the case ruling and everything that Terry's kindly given in terms of the update, we've got an equality and inclusion training course on the 28th of June from one o'clock to half four, which um, I believe is uh, remotely ran, obviously given the uh, the pandemic. Is that right, Terry? That's right. Remote. Yeah, brilliant. And disciplinary and grievance we've got coming up on the 14th of July. Again, a, a half day session remotely. And um, just to highlight that um, by attending those, they contribute towards the continuing professional development, the CPD. So um, that's an important uh, flag if, um, for everybody on that. And in terms of um, upcoming webinars, we have a few coming up that um, are in June, July and August. So we have next week, we have a webinar 
that I shall be running on how serious allegations can be handled safely. So what can we do to prevent getting to a tribunal or if we are at a tribunal, you know, what, what can we do to mitigate uh, the risk and defend claims? So we've got that coming up next week. In July, we're looking at what are protected or without prejudice conversations. And in August, we have um, a remote working webinar and how you can manage performance. And we're actually currently in the process of uh, looking at scheduling our next webinar programme from August onwards. So keep an eye out for that. And then I just want to flag a couple of other um, pieces for you. One in terms of mental health training. So, you know, this is a very big subject at the moment, mental health, you know, with the pandemic, with returning to work. And, and actually, a lot of organisations are looking to have mental health first aiders. And so um, we can provide mental health training for you and your workforce. And so they get a qualification to become a first aider in mental health. Um, so I wanted to highlight that to you uh, because obviously, um, you know mental health is very much on the increase and rise and for those organizations that don't have any employee assistance program this is just to let you know that we can put you in contact um, and we have a link with um, an organization so employee assistance programs are generally 24 7 it's that independent impartial service to help employees resolve their concerns um, and seek that guidance um, from an independent person as I indicated so there's details on the screen there if you'd like to find out more thank you Terry okay. and if you'd like to stay in the loop and be amongst the first to be invited to our webinars then um, and receive our latest news, then please do sign up to our newsletter. All the details are on the screen there. And that concludes our webinar today. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you do have any further questions, then please do contact us on the information that's showing on the screen. A copy of the slides uh, will be sent out, a recording will be posted. And as always, we do like to have your feedback. It's really important to us. So after the webinar is finished, we will send out that short survey and we would really appreciate your, your, your feedback on that because um, it just helps us to constantly improve our services for you. And so that brings me to a close and I'd like to thank Terry for his time today on a very interesting and fascinating topic and a very interesting case ruling. It really has been insightful. So thank you very much, Terry, for that. And um, I would like to also thank everybody that has joined us today and participated in the polls. It's been great having you join us. Um, I hope to see everybody on our subsequent webinars as we continue with running them. And um, I hope that everybody um, has a good rest of the week and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you, everybody.